Welcome to Yes Catholic. My name is David Patterson, and this is the place where real people share their real stories and realize that it is all God's grace that is on the move, that is working each and every day of our lives. Really excited tonight to welcome Father Eric, who is going to be sharing his story and answering your questions. Uh, he's got an incredible story. And he's got a really sweet podcast, too, called Catholic Latte. I highly recommend checking it out. He's always doing reflections. Uh, on amazing topics, and so highly recommend. Father, he uh, sent in a request. We're going to pray to the Holy Spirit that the technology will work. It says, waiting for Catholic latte. Connecting. Amen. <laughs> we did it. <laughs> Sorry, man. It's okay. All good. Welcome, Father <laughs> Eric. You just never know. Yeah, finally. You never know with technology these days. <laughs> oh, my goodness. We just gotta, We just got to pray that it will all work itself out, so. Well, yeah, yeah. Well, welcome, uh, for Father Eric. For those who don't know you, why don't you share a little bit about yourself briefly, uh, and then we'll dive in. Yeah. So right now I'm a pastor of St. Joseph Worker Parish in Oshawa. I'm also a priest chaplain of uh, Ontario Tech Dermot College in Trent. Uh, before that, I was uh, associate pastor at St. Leonard's in Brampton. Okay. And then I was associate pastor at uh, Blessed Trinity in North York. Translation: You are a busy, busy man, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right, so we're gonna we're gonna play a little rapid fire icebreaker. So I'm just gonna name off some questions. You just give me an answer as, as quickly as possible, just to get to know you a little bit better. All right? Yeah, sure. Here we go. Are you a morning person or a night person? Morning, definitely. Okay. What is your favorite movie quote? Uh, everyone's gonna think it's "Let It Go" from Frozen, but it's not <laughs> actually. <laughs> um, my the first movie I saw when I came to Toronto was uh, "The Princess Diaries," actually. Okay. And so I always like that quote by Anne Hathaway, where it's like. Uh, Courage is not the absence of fear, but the recognition that something's greater than fear. Oh, just drop the mic right there. Okay, what is your current you favorite go. worship song? Um, I think it's called The Blessing by Bethel. Okay, I saw you, I saw you comment on that. I was like, I added it to my list, but I haven't listened to it yet, so I will. I promise. Oh my gosh, it's amazing. Yeah, the bridge yeah. is off the charts. Okay, I'll have to check that out. Uh, who is your favorite author? Um, well, my, one of my favorite books is this, uh, it's got a weird Latin title, Antonio Yezu, uh, but the author is anonymous, <laughs> so I'm kind of, really? kind of dodging your question. Yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> it's a very Dick priest, so whatever, you know? All right, all right, moving on. If you could ask God one question, what would it be? Um, will you please have mercy on me, a sinner? <laughs> Amen. Amen. Describe yourself as a teenager in three words. As a teenager, um... Kind, thoughtful, and uh, thorough. Okay. Last question. Who are you regularly asking to intercede for you? Oh, definitely St. Joseph. St. Joseph. Amen to that. Yeah. All right, let's dive in opening prayer, and then we'll get you to share your story, okay? Sure. In the name of the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. Come, Holy Spirit, teach us how to pray. Okay, God, I thank you uh, so much for Father Eric. I thank you for his yes. Uh, to you and to the church. Lord, I just pray for everyone who's tuning in tonight. Just pray that you'd open our hearts to receive what you want us to receive. Lord, I pray that you just help us to decrease so you would increase and that you send your Holy Spirit just to be with us in our conversations tonight. We make this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. St. Joseph, Amen. terror of demons, please Thanks. pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. I love that Very title. Good. I love that title. Oh my gosh! Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, let's dive right so in. So we've been sorry. Go ahead. We've been we've, we've been working on this for a while, eh? They do this little interview. Yeah. Since since the Lift Jesus High rally, I guess. Eh? That's right. That's right. That was that was a, yeah. that was the last conference that I was at before COVID hit. So. Yeah, for real. <laughs> crazy, crazy times. But uh, let's dive yeah. right in. Uh, where does your story begin, Father Eric? Yeah. So I guess I'll start with my parents. Um, so my parents, they're they're both from China. So my dad's from a place called uh, Toy San in uh, southern China. Um, my mom's from a place um, called Hong Kong, which everyone knows, you know. So, yeah. and it both grew up in, in modest circumstances. So my dad, um, even when he came to Vancouver, he worked as a taxi driver. But my mom, when she was growing up in Hong Kong with her seven brothers and sisters, they, they grew up in basically a garage. So like really, really poor circumstances. Yeah. And uh, my mom, uh, when she was uh, six years old, she uh, almost died actually of kidney disease. So it's one of those things. And so um, the way she, she tells the story is that um, um, her eyes are kind of rolling back in her head type thing. And, and uh, yeah, everyone thought that she was a goner in terms of her family. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, but then they, they call a Catholic priest. Um, he came, gave her the noise to the sick, apostolic pardon and whatnot. And uh, yeah, like, you know, tip top, you know? Within and like so, overnight kind of thing? Well, like she, she basically got up and just kind of was, was like, like, I'm, yeah, I'm hungry. And, and like, yeah, she was wow. like, good, you know? Wow. Yeah. 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 So it worked out for, for her and definitely worked out for me too. You know? yeah. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Um, but then, uh, they, they both, uh, immigrated to, to BC, British Columbia okay. and they met each other and got married in, um, Vancouver, I believe. Uh, before they moved to uh, to Maple Ridge, so I, I grew up uh, for the most part in Maple Ridge, which was basically about an hour out of uh, Vancouver. Okay. So yeah. Um, now, in terms of like my parents, like I don't know, it's one of these things where you know a lot of times you talk to to parents and they're like they they want to have influence and they want to make a difference in the world, but it's just like it's it's that thing. I just focus on being the person that God wants you to be, and like yeah, I mean it's everyone's answer to like who's the most influential person in their life. It's like it's always mom and dad, you know. Mm. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so definitely the same for me. Um, and you know, what comes to mind, I remember coming across this, uh, study in sociology, I think when I was an undergrad, um, I think it was 2013 where uh, they were talking about what's most influential in terms of the formation of kids with regards to sexual morality. And you expect the answer to simply be like parents, you know, but it was like, it wasn't so much what parents said. It was what parents actually believed, mm. you know? Yeah. And so, and so it's that thing, right? So like my parents, like, you know, not the most like outspoken people in the world, but like deep conviction, you know? Mm. And so like, like, you know, kids, you know, they, they perceive what their parents actually believe, what they hold to be of, of greatest value and stuff. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, looking at my dad, um, certainly there was this thing about just doing his work carefully and well. Um, I remember even just like, cause he was a, he was a boat builder and then he was a, a real estate salesman. Okay. But I remember even when he was doing like um, just woodwork and stuff, just just the care and attention he would take to his work. Like, um, I'm just marvel at that. And it wasn't like particularly elaborate stuff. It was almost like um, like you know, a story about Da Vinci doing uh, doing an audition for the Vatican, I think, and then he did like a perfect circle, and then the Pope was like, "You're hired." <laughs> so it was that type of thing. <laughs> yeah. um, and my mom, like, um, so my dad wasn't wasn't baptized for the longest time. But my mom was was baptized, but she didn't really know her faith for a while. But she had like massively deep conviction, okay. like for real. Okay. And so it was pretty clear, like, okay, right from the get go, like what's most important is putting God first in all things. And again, it reflected in terms of how she lived her life and did her work. Yeah. So yeah, even now when I when I go back home and to visit my mom in in Vancouver, um, it sounds weird, but just even the way she does her dishes. It's just like totally fine, you know. Um, you get you get the sense like okay, that she's doing this for the glory of God, doing things carefully, well, sanctifying, ordinary work, all that type of stuff, mm, right? Yeah. So yeah, so that really came through. Yeah. Um, in terms of my uh, early faith formation, again, because my parents didn't really know, like you can only give what you have, right? So they hadn't been taught their faith in a systematic sort of way, and so um, I always thought about God, and I always had this idea of like having like the perfect day in terms of like, you know, that I could offer to the Lord, but I didn't have any knowledge of my faith, my faith. And I, I didn't pray in a systematic sort of way. We weren't going to mass on a regular basis. Okay. Um, catechism was lacking. So all, mm. all that stuff. Right. Yeah. Um, although when I was in high school, um, kind of how things changed and this came through in one of the, um, the quotes I, that was posted through your, through your site. Mm -hmm. But like, um, my, my dad, he had, um, he had this, this really kind of complicated health situation. So he had a lot of internal bleeding. And so they couldn't, um, they couldn't do the operation. Like they just was like, okay, if you, he's already has a lot of bleeding internally right now. So if we do the op operation, like that's it. Like, you know, so my mom was praying really desperately. It was just like, look, um, just like, you know, Lord, just keep him alive at least till like till Rick, my, my name in, in growing up was Rick. Um, yeah. till Rick like graduates from high school, you know? Okay. And so, um, you know, like immediately he didn't get like perfectly better, but like good enough so they could do the, the surgery. Yeah. And so, and so like, yeah. And so then he, he lived for a number of years and uh, he got sick again, just when I was graduating high school, you know? And, uh, and so at that point, my mom realized that, you know, you know, the Lord had answered her prayers. And so, um, so she's like, okay, you know, like now's his time. Right. And so he, he died of uh, liver cancer. You know, I'm sorry, man. Oh, no, it's okay. So that was in 96. And, um, 
And, and again, one of the things I, I said, uh, I think, in, in the, one of the reflections for your, for your website was like, um, in the seminary, they always ask you, like, well, I don't know if they still do, but they asked in my seminary application, what, what's the best thing to happen to you? What's the worst thing? Mm -hmm. And I wasn't trying to be poetic, but it was just like, <laughs> like, for real, it's like the death of my father, you know? Uh, because, you know, worst thing for obvious reasons, but the best thing, um, because it helped to kind of bring us back to the faith mm -hmm. and bring us back to the church, you know? Because mm -hmm. um, what happened was there was a priest that came by and he uh, anointed my father. Um, but first of all, baptized him, confirmation, you know, the whole nine yards. Oh, in the thing, hospital. Right? Yeah, yeah. Wow, wow. So, so that was that was really cool. Um, and then uh, afterwards, I think either yeah, I guess the the guy who did the funeral afterwards, because uh, usually I guess there's a donation um, when you do like a funeral in the Catholic Church. And so he said like, look, I'll, I'll waive the fee, um, but you guys gotta start going to mass, <laughs> you know, because wow. he knew we. Yeah, we knew we knew we weren't going to mass. Yeah, and so and so that that kind of set us on the right path, you know. Amazing. So that was kind of nice. So yeah, so yeah. you started going to mass regularly after that, then. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, when I was, I know, yeah, when I was, uh, yeah, when we were in Vancouver, for sure. Like uh, my, you know, because we were in Maple Ridge, and we moved it back to Vancouver type thing. Yeah. Or moved to Vancouver, and my when I was when we were with our, our our mom, like we were pretty consistent. But then I, when I went to um, uh, undergrad and then law school, it was like still kind of sporadic, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but I I tried to go more often for sure. Yeah. But it wasn't like it was one of those things where like I was one of those guys where like uh, like I, I caught the end of the, of the homily type thing, and I went yeah. to liturgy Eucharist. Right. Yeah. So right. okay. Terrible. It's funny. Anyways. It's funny though how you look back on your life and you're like, man, like <laughs> you know, it's it's just a even for me, like, I don't know. Yeah. It's just, yeah, true. It's amazing how, how yeah. the Lord can lead you, you know? Well, it's, it's kind of neat in a certain sense because um, even now when I, when I see people in the office or I see them in a confession, and I'm like, oh, Father, you're not, you're not going like, to, like, here's my thing. Here's the big buildup in terms of, like, you know, my sins or, like, my, my faults, my struggles. And it's like, you, you don't know my life. Like you, yeah. you, like, you know, yeah. like, you don't know me, right? So yeah. it's like, okay, okay, I'll let you do the buildup, right? But, like... <laughs> Whatever it is, it's okay, you know. Um, yeah. So when I when we moved to um, Vancouver, um, I went to the University of British Columbia. Okay. So I did I did uh, my undergrad in English literature, and uh, it's kind of funny because sometimes I go to parishes and I, I'll say I did my degree in English, and people are like, "Yeah, your English is like really good. I'm like you don't have an accent and stuff." <laughs> it's like, no, no, like, like I don't speak Chinese. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyways awkward. but uh yeah a little bit awkward yeah but um but it worked out though because um I and mean, everyone thinks that okay like in terms of like, giving talks and homilies it's because like i was in law school but actually it was because i did my english degree because you, you learn about obviously like grammar and like structure and mm -hmm. how to make an argument and poetry and stuff like that right. so that that was really a, a game game changer um when i went to after that i went to law school in halifax so I went to Dalhousie and um, yeah, like it was, again, like I was, I was going to mass more frequently, but if I did, I would come late, typically come at the end of the homily type thing. Okay. And I remember there was a, a friend of mine uh, named Karen Cheng, who eventually um, joined the, she eventually changed with the convent. And oh, wow. so she's a, yeah, she's a member now of the Sisters of Our Lady of the Blessed, uh, of the Most Holy Trinity. So yeah. Sister Mary James Highlands uh, community, right? Oh, wow. yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so I knew her in undergrad when I was at UBC. And then so I went to law school. She was doing her PhD in chemistry, I think. And I always make fun of her, like to her face, not behind her back, because that'd be rude, right? <laughs> but like to her face, I'm like, you know, um, you're like the friend I could never get rid of. <laughs> you know? and, so, and so when we were in, uh, when I was doing law school and she was like doing her PhD, she would always like invite me for stuff. And um, I would always tell her no, you know, yeah. and it wasn't even necessarily to go out like to church stuff. It was just like, you know, go out for a coffee, like whatever. Right. And I, I, just, I would always say no. Um, sometimes I would say yes and just not show up. It was like so bad. Right. Yeah. And then but she kept on asking so much. I thought, OK, fine, fine. Like she's like asking so much. It was kind of annoying. So I'll go. <laughs> right. Sorry. And, and the thing, yeah, no, for real. And the thing I went to, it was <laughs> of all things, it wasn't. It wasn't coffee at Starbucks. It was um, it was uh, a, a reconciliation service at a church. That's what you agreed to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, 
<laughs> so it wasn't even like so you gotta imagine right so like my my first confession um uh grade two it was like bless me father for i've sinned i may have punched someone in the face it was like really bad right and so like so this would have been like my second confession ever and like i'm in law school and stuff yeah and it, it wasn't even like oh man like i've sinned before the lord like i, sh I should really repent of my sins and like and make amends and this sort mm -hmm. of thing it wasn't any of that it was like, you know what, Karen's singing in the choir during this reconciliation service. And so she's going to be here to the end of the thing. There's like nothing to do, nothing to read here. So I might as well go to confession because there's nothing else to do. So, God can work with that. So, he can yeah, work with that. Yeah. Right? yeah. And like, again, like poorly catechized, second confession ever. I'm in law school. And um, I, I gave my confession and it was integral looking back on it, but like, like just gaps, eh? Mm -hmm. And then I remember the priest like saying, okay, well, for your penance, um, stations of the cross. And I was so poorly catechized. I thought, wow, that sounds like really excessive. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, but I remember feeling this huge difference though, like between the before and the after, you know? Mm. So like before absolution after, and it was just like, yeah. like huge, like peace and that sort of thing. And it was the first yeah. time I kind of, was thinking like, cause I never experienced anything like that before, you know? And so, um, it was the first time I kind of thought, well, maybe there's something more to this Catholic church thing that I'm giving it credit for, you know? And so, you know, they, they say every priest only has uh, one homily, you know, and it's probably true. We try to dress it up to make sure, to try to make, <laughs> make sure you guys don't notice, you know, <laughs> but it is true. But I, I think for, for me, I'm always speaking from that experience. You know, mm. in a sense that like, um, never mind, like, you know, get the people to the sacraments and get people to confession and like, you know, God's at work in a powerful way through his, his, his sacraments with the church. Yeah. But kind of more to the point, like, um, there is nothing like being in right relationship with Christ. Like the peace beyond all understanding, right? So like, yeah. you could try to create your perfect circumstances or whatever, but like, no, like, I mean, I went into the confession there poorly catechized there was no there was nothing on my part it was it was barely integral mm. and like before and after i have this piece that is again beyond all, all imagining right so it's just like yeah. holy cow like there's something to this right yeah um yeah yeah so that was really a, a bit of a game changer but but see here's the thing though I, I still didn't know my faith right right so then you can have this this experience and it's like it's almost like going to the retreat or something like that it's like oh you could see adoration and confession and then you know your faith you fall back in your old habits and sins and yeah, yeah, yeah like we know that story right yeah so so that was a thing and um so that was that was like law school for well law school was three years and so that was going on for a couple of years um did you, but tell, then what did happened, you tell your friend though after confession or were you just kind of like casual i did you did okay no no i wasn't casual or cool about it at all i just told okay. her and yeah 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 and she was she had no idea you know so she was just inviting me to stuff wow but uh yeah yeah so that was pretty neat. yeah um yeah so like the so then when i was living in um halifax i lived in this undergrad residence because i kind of wanted to meet friends or something right mm -hmm. so it was just um there's an undergrad residence and there was this guy, the only practicing Catholic guy, as far as I knew, uh, living in the residence was this guy living next door to me. And so we became friends and he eventually moved to Toronto hmm. and entered the seminary. And uh, so I, I graduated law school and then I, I eventually, I didn't follow him, but I just happened to be in Toronto too, you know? Yeah. Um, so, so basically, um, before I get to that, so when I was working as a lawyer, um, I, uh, I, well, first of all, I didn't really like law school, to be honest. I didn't like law school, and I didn't like working as a lawyer until my final year working as a lawyer, actually. Mm. Um, and um, it's one of those things. I, I'm, uh, I'm fortunate for the experience of having gone to law school because, uh, like, it's definitely a conversation starter. <laughs> yeah. And it, and it, yeah, and it kind of gives, like, credibility. Because I know I look, like, ridiculously young, right? So... I got a milk for all it's worth, but um, <laughs> so, 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 like, um, yeah. So like, you know, being a lawyer, that's, that's sort of that. There's the kind of the cachet and stuff, yeah. but I, I didn't really like working as a lawyer um, until, until my final year, my, my, the final law firm I worked for. Hmm. And just like everything about how they did their work and just the people there was great. And, and I just feel like God gave me a really good experience in terms of like, um, you know, working in the world. You know, mm -hmm. so I, I could always kind of look back on that with fond memories. Right. And it was kind of neat, too, because they always um, 
they always invited me back to the law firm um, in the summers really? when I was working in the seminary. Yeah, so, which is nice to pay off my student loans. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, yeah. So and then so whenever I would go back, I'd be like, I'd be the, the unofficial like Catholic chaplain at the at the law firm. And yeah. Stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but um, anyways, um, so in Toronto, um, I stayed in contact with my friend from undergrad or from from the, uh, res- the undergrad residence, and he went to seminary. And he invited me to to this thing. I think it was an Advent, um, uh, like recollection or uh, Advent concert. I think. Was he going to St. Augustine? So me- yeah, St. Augustine. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So he invited me to go to that. So I went. And um, so when I was there, I met another seminarian who would in turn introduce, introduce me to my first spiritual director. Mm. Um, so that's how things that got, got, kind of went. But the way he did it was kind of sneaky, actually, because he was like, "Oh, you know, I'm a seminarian." We were out for dinner, right? He was like, "Oh, I'm a seminarian. I need to, I need to pray." And like, um, "You mind if I stop by this thing?" And I was like, oh, "Okay, whatever. I have no idea what seminarians do." But it was all just a ruse, right? <laughs> and so he's like, "Oh, look, here's this guy. Maybe you can like talk to him and stuff." <laughs> it's like, yeah. dude. So, nice. but whatever, it worked. It worked. Clearly, so, <laughs> nice. but, yeah, yeah. So some of those tricks work out. Yeah. So, uh, so I met with the, that guy. He was my first first director, and um, I remember coming to him in my first session. And I'm thinking like, whatever. So I'm thinking like, I'll share with them my hopes and dreams and all these things I want to do, all these things I want to be and like all my, you know, like things I want to do for the Lord and stuff. And at the end, I, I expected him, <laughs> I expected him to be like, that's awesome. Like, it's great. And I affirm you and your hopes and dreams and yeah. your desire to seek glory for the Lord. But it was like, you know what? Um, that's great and all, but like, you don't pray and you don't know your faith worth like. I'm paraphrasing. He didn't say that, but, <laughs> but, but, but he goes, but like, said. yeah, that's pretty much what he said. And wow. he goes like, look, if, if, if you, if you don't get this thing like locked in, you could strive to do all these things, but you're going to collapse and you're not going to, you're not going to make it. Right. Wow. And I remember being like, so arrogant. Like I remember being so mad. Like what the heck? <laughs> Who do you think you are? <laughs> Who do you think you are? Yeah. Yeah. And, all, and then he wanted me to pray for fi- the Bible for five minutes a, a day. I was like, Oh my gosh, five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> that, that seems excessive. <laughs> that's like you're lying. Eh? Well, that seems excessive to break. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Just no, no sense of discipline. But uh, yeah, so one of those things. Uh, later on, he um, introduced me to my second spiritual director. Because um, what happened? He wanted vacation, and he was like, "Look, we're like, you know, um, different franchise locations. So like, if I go on vacation, you can just see this other guy." Right. And then that's fine. We're interchangeable. So, but then, but then that guy ended up becoming my new source director. I just stayed with this guy. Yeah. And um, this guy, um, he was um, an older priest and um, very soft spoken, very humble, this sort of thing. Right. And he would always talk about like um, the plan of life, you know? And so uh, what he meant by that were like spiritual norms, you know, like, are you going to mass on a regular basis and mm-hmm. like, confession? Yeah prayer, spiritual reading, all that stuff, right? And uh, so how it'll go is like, I'll go to see him and I'll be like, oh, here are these different things on my mind, on my heart, right? And he'd be like, yeah, yeah. So uh, how's your plan of life going? <laughs> and so like, I was ignoring all these things that are bringing up. Yeah. And so at a certain point, he said to me, he goes, you know, Eric, you probably realize that um, the only thing I really care about is the plan of life. I'm like, yeah, I, I got that vibe because you ignore <laughs> everything else that I say, right? So. Yeah. And at first it was, it was kind of annoying. Um, but then later on, I talked to my friend uh, from law school who's living in the undergrad residence. And he was sharing his personal opinion about spiritual directors, right? And he goes, look, um, my opinion is that one indicator that someone's a good spiritual director is that a lot of vocations come from his ministry and his spiritual direction. Mm. So you might want to ask your director, like how many people he's seen in the past have gone on to become priests or yeah. religious or whatever. Right. So I asked this guy and like, just casually, just casually in passing, he's like, I don't know, like dozens. <laughs> yeah, like dozens. Like, did, like, that, did, that, did that kind of scare you in that moment a little bit or? Uh, no, no, but it should have actually. I see where you're going with that. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, 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 but like dozens, like holy cow, you know? Um, but then it kind of like in retrospect, I, I realized, okay, now like that's the thing, right? So like the primacy of the plan of life. You know, so I, I remember even, you know, recently talking to my internship pastor and he was, he was talking about this where he's like, you know, when I see people for, for spiritual direction, um, he goes, a lot of people, they like to like talk about the spiritual life, 
or talk about God or like, you know, my opinion about this at the church and whatever. Right. He goes, mm -hmm. but what I'm listening for is like, do they do their work? First of all, like, do they have this, this correspondence habitually to the duty of the present moment? And do they say their prayers? If no to like one or both, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I don't want to see you. Cause mm -hmm. what the heck are we doing? <laughs> you know, yeah. we're just talking, we're just talking a good game, you know, but like, yeah. Um, the relationship with God, if it's not like, if it doesn't become concrete in terms of those things, like what the heck are we doing? Mm -hmm. are, are you just a guy who just loves talking about church things? Right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, now he's a much older priest. So I've never said that to one of my directees, but I thought it strongly. <laughs> 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 anyways. Um, yeah. So anyways, like, um, you know, being a, a lawyer, especially in, in Toronto, I, I, uh, I dated people, but it, it didn't last very long. Like, cause I would always think of it in terms of like God's calling, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And so, um, it was like quite apart from like, whether you're attracted to someone or whether or not you have good chemistry, it's like, is God calling me to the vocation of marriage? And if so, is he calling me to be with this person? Mm -hmm. And if not, like, what the heck are you doing? Yeah. Like you're taking someone from their potential husband or their future vocation, however you want to frame it. You know? Right. It's a good mindset. So like, yeah, totally. You know, like, um, uh, like uh, the example that always comes to mind, I think it was Trent Horn who said, like, if you're dating someone, the three options are you get married, you break up, or one or both of you dies. <laughs> like, that's, that's, those are the options, you know? Yeah. yeah. And you, you tell me about that, they go through the mental role decks, and it's like, oh, yeah, I guess, yeah, there's no, there's no fourth option, right? Right. Um, yeah. So as a result, I, I dated people for like max, like a month. Okay. And then we we'll just kind of break up and stuff. Mm -hmm. um but yeah you know, on that note i remember um in a seminary there was a friend of mine who was uh he he met someone on, on internship and um you know like they, they had good chemistry physically mutual physical attraction like that type of thing and he was mm -hmm. he was kind of like oh man should i leave the seminary and stuff and he was too checking apparently to talk to his own spiritual director so we talked to my director <laughs> he's telling me about this afterwards and he said um you know so i was telling him about all the things i didn't like about seminary you know like i didn't like the classes i didn't get along with the guys and like you know, the professors and the classes, like however you want to frame it, right? Mm -hmm. And um, and so um, the priest said to him in response, okay, like, fine, but do you feel called now to leave the seminary and go marry this girl and everything that entails, providing for her needs in the context of like the vocation of marriage? Right. And he meant for him to like kind of take that away in prayer and ponder that for a couple of weeks, but instantly he was like, well, no, <laughs> right? It's like, okay. So what the heck are we doing? Yeah. Which I thought was an interesting approach. Like quite apart from like, you're a seminarian, seminarians don't date girls. So like stop that now because I'm telling you under, under obedience type thing. Right. It's like, well, no, just like, just think about, think it through logically. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that sort of thing, like it keeps you safe, like situating yourself in like God's call, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, Cause like, I remember like, you know, whenever guys would come back from an internship, they would always you know, do the presentation for the seminary community and, and like they would always say some variation of like, Hey guys, you know, just, I know it's rough in here, but when you go out to the internship and you meet the people of God and churches, like you realize you got gifts and talents and you, they love you and that affirms you in your vocation. And I always thought like, no, nah, that, that doesn't make sense. Right. It's like, Oh, I, oh, like I wasn't sure about my vocation, but now, Hey, I go into parish. I realize I can, I got gifts and talents and people love me. Well, I must be called to this. <laughs> it's like oh, no. it's irrelevant it's yeah. Irrelevant. yeah right yeah like what is god calling you to do and like if, right. if it's this then whatever just go ahead right yeah. so um anyway so um so i was in seminary for gosh like six years and um so i i did i hadn't done philosophy before so i did one year of philosophy mm -hmm. uh four years of theology and in the internship year and um I mean, seminary is supposed to be like this. It's supposed to be like a desert experience. So it was, it was pretty rough for yeah. sure. You know, um, I think but, it's supposed um, to be, you know, like, as you said. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. So even now when I look back and it's just like, what helps you to become the priest that God's calling to be? It's like the, the dark times mm -hmm. and the desert experience. Mm -hmm. like it's not like, I mean, it's not they teach you in terms of substantive stuff like canon law and like pastoral practice. Like you can learn that like pretty quick, you know? Yeah. yeah. But like the prolonged thing of like the five, six years and whatever, like, um, yeah, that's, that's what kind of makes you, you know? Mm -hmm. So like, um, like I remember going to this, um, vocations conference in Dallas, Texas, I think a long time ago. And, uh, one of the, one of the guys giving the talks was like, um, uh, I think he's quoting Adrian von Spire, you know, and saying that like, 
um, knowledge plus suffering equals wisdom. Mm -hmm. That's good. You know? Yeah. 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 And so, and there's this thing where like, it's not just reserved for the elite, right? But like, okay, if you want to become the person that God wants you to be, like, okay, good catechesis, right? But then also, you know, <laughs> be prepared for an ordeal, right? Yeah. And, and, and so, and it's not even just like an acute thing, like, oh gosh, I had a headache on Monday. It's just it's this prolonged thing that's close to the heart, right? Mm -hmm. um, for the flesh stuff, right? Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Um, and you can tell, I mean, you talk to people, it's just like, yeah, that person's like, you know, not just, just been through a lot, but that person has a wisdom that's been born out of, so, the immersion in, in the crucified experience. Yeah. 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 One hundred percent. Yeah. Um, so, uh, sorry, I think I'm missing a step. So when I was, when I was assigned to, um, cause I, you know, I, the, my spiritual director knew I had, um, priesthood on my mind. And so, um, before I turned, like, um, he was like, look, um, you're doing all the right stuff, which is an important prerequisite, right? It's not like the rich young man, like, what good deed must I do in inherit eternal life? And like the preliminary answer is like, okay, like don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal, don't kill people, right? Like, yeah. like the Lord has to say that, right? <laughs> and, and then after that, you know, sell everything, sell out and follow me. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like this, like, okay, like I'm discerning the vocation and like, you know, I'm saying my prayers and going to mass and going to confession, all these different things, right? And for a long period of time too, not necessarily for a couple of weeks. Right. And so he knew all that. And so he goes, okay, so all you need to do right now is, um, you know, I mean, also on top of that, you've clarified the options. And so now you just need to make, you, need to, you just need to set a deadline for yourself and then make a decision by that deadline and then hold yourself to that decision. Hmm. And I think what he contemplated was like something like six months or something. But I was like, ah, two weeks, <laughs> you know? Wow. And during those, yeah, during those two weeks, see, you, know, you got to keep this in mind. I, I, didn't, I knew nothing about, say, Ignatius and Ignatius spirituality and constellation okay. desolation and stuff, right? So right. the two weeks leading up to, so I, I applied, okay, so, Two weeks of, of like kind of discerning on my own. Okay, I gotta make a decision by the two weeks. Massive constellation, right? Mm. And then I apply to the seminary, and now they're processing my claim in a certain sense. And then <laughs> massive desolation, <laughs> you know. And I'm talking, yeah. So like I'm talking to my Catholic buddies who don't know like you know the, about these things. They're like, oh my gosh, you can't enter the seminary feeling like this, blah, blah, whatever. Yeah. But luckily, my spiritual director like was pretty smart guy. So he's like, no, Good. like I know what you're feeling, but like yeah. don't worry about it. You're okay. And yeah. Stuff. So uh, yeah. So like entered, you know, um, but again, like being in the seminary was, was pretty rough. Um, felt like kind of a fish out of water, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, I remember even the first week, you know, they kind of didn't line up the new guys, you know, but they kind of was like, they were identifying the new guys in, 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 the, in the community and like, Oh, this guy did this and that, whatever part of this club and he was part of this, whatever. And I was like, Oh, here's Eric Mon, he's a lawyer. <laughs> that's it like barely Catholic and yet, and, and yet the Lord is like and, and I am going to use that man for my glory <laughs> you God know you. yeah no seriously yeah. yeah no they felt like a big fat loser at the time though <laughs> but so, um, anyways yeah so um, things were coming to a head and so um, there was internship obviously in the middle of the seminary formation time mm -hmm. and I remember thinking that um there is no way this is going to end with me um, coming out and continuing on. I thought there's no way. In like, the internship about, year, you're saying? Yeah, going into it. Okay. Yeah, I just thought like like I'm I'm, I'm not it's not but I, I remember thinking like I'm not going to have this thing not work out because of lack of try. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to try. I'm going to give it my all and stuff like that. But mm -hmm. I just like I just can't imagine me going on like past this, you know. And I remember talking to my spiritual director. And he said, uh, okay, I hear what you're saying, right? But you need to go into this thing, making a firm act of the will with a sense of joyful expectation. You know, like, Lord, I, I feel this thing and I have all these perhaps reasons why I think things are going to end disastrously. But because you're the Lord and you shower people with abundant bless, bless, blessings and graces. Yeah. Like, I, I joyfully expect not just like small blessings, but like abundant blessings, mm. you know? And internship, it turned out to be like one of the best years of my life. For sure. Wow. You know, like painful, like painful as ass, right? But like, yeah. but like, but like really good because, um, like I was assigned to Monsignor Shihi, Monsignor Ambo Shihi, and like, um, like he, um, he's so good, right? And like looking back on it, I mean, I almost didn't have the terminology to kind of like articulate it, but like, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I remember going to a conference later on where this guy was um, talking about um, Jesus molding the disciples. Right. 
and he said, you know, like if you pay attention to the gospels, like, like he goes, you got to read between the lines, right? Like there are times when the Lord like gives a talk, like I'm teaching you the Our Father, or here's like the Sermon on the Mount, right? Yeah. So like he's not against that. But if you read between the lines, like, there's a lot of like hanging out with people, mm -hmm. you know? So yeah. like there's one, um, there's apparently a, a running joke among scripture scholars where like, if you look at the gospels, Jesus is either having a meal or going to a meal or leaving a meal. You know? <laughs> so, so, there's, so there's a lot of just hanging out with guys, right? Yeah. And uh, the speaker was saying like, um, the thing you got to realize is that none of that is wasted time, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Because the whole thing, okay, what is love? Love is time plus attention. Mm. Right. And so, um, so I, I remember in the context of this one particular talk, the guy giving the talk was, was speaking to seminary formators. Right. And he said, okay, like you got to realize that, for example, here are a bunch of guys who come from broken backgrounds and just because they come from the world. Right. And so like rather than throw our hands up and say like, Oh, we, we lament the, the passing of a golden age. Right. Like, like, what do you do? Like, okay. The, the solution is love. Right. But it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's a concrete thing. Like love equals time and attention. So he goes, what you want to do with these guys is, is follow the example of Christ where you're journeying with them and just give you like giving them tons of time and attention, just hanging out, you know, eating with them, just like whatever, like just telling jokes. What, and, and, it, and it seems like, well, like, what is this? Right. But no, like what you're doing is like, you're, you're, you're proving the fact that like, I, I love you and you know, cause I'm there and you're being Christ to them. Yeah. Right. And then he says, and, and he goes on top of that, like, so what happens is, is you're setting yourself up so that you can preach to them the difficult truth where they will receive it from you and they won't receive it from someone else because you've given them your time and attention. Yeah. Right? yeah. Um, and I think for Monsignor, it was like that, you know? So like, I remember in the early going on internship, like he, he wanted to do the thing that he did, he did with all his previous interns where like he has this book called Priest of the Third Millennium by uh, Father um, or Cardinal Timothy Dolan at the time yeah. of his father, I think. And he would like pick a chapter like, on humility and like, okay, you read it. I read it. We talk about it, you know, next week type thing. Yeah. But within a couple of weeks, it was just like, can we not use this book? Can I just like talk to you about all my demons and darkness and my struggles and stuff. And, and we would just talk it through, you know, and, and he would just give me like hours of his time. Wow. You know? And, and also too, I mean, here, here's the funny thing. Like, I mean, this might sound kind of weird, but like, um, sometimes you're so used to things being the way that they are that you like, you kind of bury your wounds, you know? Mm. So if someone asks you like, are you hurting? It's like, no, no, I'm like, fine. Right. But actually you're like, you're really sad or you're really angry or really yeah. whatever. Right. Yeah. And so routinely what he'll do with me is it's like, um, Hey, you know, like our rooms are across from each other. Right. So he'd be like, Hey, um, something's bothering you. We should talk. Right. I'm like, no, like nothing's bothering me. I'm good. He goes, no, no, something. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. He was, and I wasn't even lying to him. I was thinking, like, I, I nothing comes to mind. And he'll keep on bugging me and be like, okay, fine. So we sit across from each other, and he'd be like, um, yeah, so what is it, right? I'm like, no, I, nothing comes to mind. And he'll, like, dig, dig, dig. And after a while, I was like, oh, man. Oh, man, there is something there. Oh, huh. yeah. well, actually, that's a really significant something. After a while, I was, like, bawling my eyes out and stuff. Yeah, yeah. And we would do that, like, over and over again throughout the entire year, you know? Um. And that's, that's the thing. I mean, I, I talk about the sacramental thing and encounter with Christ through that and right relationship with Christ. But, but this other thing I'm talking about right now, like that's really come to influence my whole approach to ministry as well. You know, it, well, it sounds like authentic friendship at its finest. You know, it's, it's kind of like you, you ask, how are you? But then you, you actually pause and wait for them to actually say, no, 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 no. but how are you really? You know? Yeah. And there's a yeah. difference there. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Like, it, it's so funny that we, um, even with people we like, it's just like, oh, what, what's Joe like? Joe is, Joe is nice. You know, it's like, well, I don't know Joe, but like, he's more than nice. You know, like yeah. everyone's like a mystery other than even unto themselves. Right. And so, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that was really helpful. Um, now later on, um, uh, I was, it was coming to a head in like, in my seminary formation and, uh, um, basically like, so when you get close to the end that you got to like sign this letter. It's like, I agree to basically be celibate for life. And I didn't know you had to sign that letter. So it's just like, Oh gosh, this came up on a Wednesday. <laughs> it's like, I, I guess this is, this is for real. Right. And so, um, I, I just wasn't like, I wasn't really sure about everything. Hmm. Um, and so what happened was, um, there was a priest friend of mine who introduced me to this, um, this directee that he knew who, um, 
had these kind of mystical abilities, you know? And so he had the ability to kind of read souls and whatnot. And uh, I don't say that very lightly, but this guy was, I think he was pretty legit. And so we're kind of hanging out and we're talking and stuff. And he said, um, you're, you're afraid, right? And I was like, yeah, I don't, I don't know how you know that, but yeah, no, for sure, I'm afraid. And he goes, you're afraid that um, if you get ordained, you're afraid of two things. You're afraid if you get ordained, um, you, you won't last and that you won't be a very good priest. And in particular, you're afraid that if you get ordained that you'll last maybe for a couple years, but then you'll just give up and you'll leave the priesthood in disgrace. <laughs> I thought like, I don't know how you know that, but <laughs> like for real, for real. Sounds like it just hit and your then, heart fast. It yeah. Right to the heart. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Like just like, not just fear, but here's like your shade of fear. Like this is it, you know? Yeah. And, um, um, and then he said, okay, well, you know, that's all that, all that I said is just uh, is a lie, you know? Cause the truth of the matter is, um, when you get ordained, you will last and you will endure and you'll be a very good priest. And because of Christ working through your priesthood, many, many people will not go to hell. You know, I got to be honest and, that and say, like, I just feel like God's presence, like completely nonstop right now, even as you say those words. Oh, like, thanks, buddy. Yeah. That it's true. I, like, That's I always, true. Like, I, I always, um, gotta be careful the way i tell that story because i don't want people to think i'm being arrogant because like you, like you gotta appreciate that like because it, it's the whole the entire story because when he said that thing about my fears like like you said it, it cut me to the heart you know because it's like that's how i felt you will not last and you will be a terrible priest <laughs> and so like for him to say that other things like oh <laughs> okay you know so there was that but one more thing that really put me over the top with ordination um so like obviously i'm a huge movie buff right and uh i don't know, I don't know if people know that i there. figured that out pretty <laughs> quick <laughs> yeah, sir. yeah so when i first came to toronto the first movie i ever saw was was princess diaries yeah with um yeah, and hathaway yeah. and um uh but then like later on like like you know like i just kind of developed this habit like whenever i'll be stressed I always had to go to a dark movie theater and just like by myself and see a movie by myself and like short of like a skanky movie, I'd just go see it just like for the sake of just being alone in a dark theater type thing, you know? Mm. So I'll do this and then that would always kind of make me feel decompressed. Um, and so when, I was th when things were coming to a head near my, near my, near my, my seminary formation, I thought like, okay, I, I, I'm going to see a movie. And um, because it was, it was a Sunday and we were just released from the seminary after like the Sunday mass, I thought I got to go to a theater that has weird show times, you know, and they aren't, they aren't like the show times now. Like now every theater has weird show times, you know, yeah, but that's true. Uh, <laughs> like at the time it was like Silver City Young and Eglinton had the weird show times, you know, okay. yeah. so everyone else was, everyone else was like 12, 4, 7, and 9, and they had like 3, 5, you know, 10, 30 or something, right? Right. Yeah. So I thought I'll, I'll, I'll go there and whatever's playing at like 3, uh, again, short of an inappropriate film, I'll go see that. And so when I went, it was um, Stars and Strollers night. I don't know if you know what that is, but um, it's for like mothers and their babies. Oh, <laughs> so, like, sorry, yes, yes, so, I'm aware. Yeah, so like, it's so, like you go and like the lights are up a little bit, the they sound's are. not too loud, you're not scared of babies. Yeah, you know, baby changing station and stuff. Yeah, so, yeah. so like, like that's the movie I went to, and it was it was um, Diary of a Wimpy Kid. Okay, based on the children's books. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like, yeah, so it's like me and the, and the moms and their babies and. <laughs> And you know, just yeah. So I'm watching this this movie, right? And I'm thinking like, or oh, trying man, to gonna... watch the movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. So I'm thinking this is gonna be ridiculous, but like whatever. Yeah, I'm watching this for therapeutic purposes. Um. So yeah. So I'm watching this movie, and, and just spoiler alert. Not that anyone out there cares, but um, <laughs> um. So it's, it revolves around this this kid who's he's wimpy, and he's in I guess he's in school, and he's trying to be the most popular kid in school, and so. Uh, he has this, this sidekick named Rowley, who's this kind of like, you know, pudgy fat kid type thing. And like, you know, kind of socially awkward, but like good kid, you know, yeah. and good friend. And so what happens is the, the wimpy kid is scheming and to try to become a popular kid in school. It's not working. In the meantime, like, um, he's almost like kind of like, like falling back and, and dragging Rowley with him. 
And so at a certain point, Rally gets in trouble. He breaks his arm and stuff, but he's like still trying to stay, stay faithful. So what happened was um, near the end of the movie, there were these older kids who um, had uh, wronged, who had been wronged by the wimpy kid um, earlier on in the film. And so they, they're trying to get back at um, both Rally and the wimpy kid, even though Rally's innocent. And so, um, uh, again, early in the film, there was this whole thing involving the cheese, the cheese touch. And so basically, there was this moldy piece of, chi- of uh, cheese that was on right. the playground floor. Yeah. And so it had just been left there. And so basically, the whole idea is that if someone touches that cheese, they're like infected with the cheese touch. And then there, this one kid was banished back to like Eastern Europe or something like that, right? Right. So the, the older kids are like, well, what can we do to punish these guys? So they, they see the moldy piece of cheese. And they're like, okay, we're going to make rally eat the piece of cheese. So he picks it up, um, he takes a bite, you know, recess bell goes on, uh, goes off, and then like the, the kids come out and then they look at him and then they see him holding this piece of cheese, bite's been taken out. And so you think, okay, if the guy from Eastern Europe was banished back to Eastern Europe, what's gonna happen to Rally now he's taken out a bite of the cheese, right? Yeah. So they, they look at him and the, you can tell they're about to like reject him and hate him forever, you know? And um, and meanwhile, you look at Rowley, and he's like, he is crying, his lip is trembling and stuff. And then um, they're about to, like, you know, say, like, oh, Rowley ate the cheese, where the wimpy kid jumps in, and he goes, I ate the cheese. So now everyone hates him, but his friend is spared. Yeah. And then and then that's when the movie that's when the movie ends, right? So yeah. they're they're reconciled, and they're friends, and everyone hates both of them. But who cares? Because we're together. So I'm watching this thing. And uh, again, starts in Strollers Night, babies, moms, and stuff like that, right? And I'm like bawling my eyes out, right? Because it's just like, and this is this is the movie which propelled me to the priesthood, right? Wow. <laughs> because, because the thing is, it's like Rowley is emblematic of Christ, mm-hmm. right? Because what happens, a lot of guys, like, um, and just people in general, when they're discerning, like, vocations like this, they're like, they say, oh, okay, I'm discerning and I'm not sure about my vocation, right? But what they really mean a lot of times is like, Lord, I am hedging my bets. And you got to guarantee that if I do this thing, that it's going to end up well for me. Mm. And short of that, like, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to say, I'll, I'm not sure about the call, right? Mm. Whereas like, you're totally sure. You're just afraid, you know? Yeah. So that kind of hit me against the wall because it's just like, okay, like, you know, it's like what I should actually focus on is like, okay, now here's the Lord and he's like real and whatever. And he is calling me. And so if he is, then like, I do it because it's pleasing to him, you know? Yeah. And like, whatever happens to me happens. Yeah. You know? And so what happened, I wouldn't necessarily put this in my vocations uh, newsletter, but like, <laughs> like I, got, I got, I got ordained thinking that every day after I got ordained would be just like awful. But I thought, you know what, whatever. It's the Lord, and he's wonderful. Mm. And so, so I'm going to eat the cheese. Wow. Yeah. 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 But then what yeah. happened is, you know, you know, things are the opposite of awful. It's pretty darn great, you know? So. Wow. Yeah. Thanks be to God for that. Yeah. And so after seeing that movie, you kind of, did you leave that theater with like, all right, I'm all in. Yep. Totally. It's, incre- cool. it's incredible how, um, like, a movie that's not even Christian, you know, can, can just totally speak, though, to the human heart in, in a way that leads you in yeah. your vocation, you know, and how beautiful that is. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. Anything which is authentically good, true, true and beautiful, it's mm-hmm. the Lord, you know? Yeah. Um, but it's so funny because I remember, like, one of my friends in, in Centenary, he was, just during a come and see weekend, he was like, oh, Eric has the ability to see really, uh, you know, interesting things, Christian themes and movies, but he always picks like the dumbest movies. <laughs> it's like, dude, like, this guy doesn't know me. Yeah. So, you don't know me. He's not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so, That's amazing. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, wow. What a story. I'm like, I didn't know half of that. And that's, that's incredible. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. I mean, if you look at the comments that was flying and especially when you said, I think, um, you know, it might come off a little bit arrogant. And as you said that, I was thinking arrogance, like all I've been hearing is humility as you share your story. And you can even see in the comments, like, thank you so much for your vulnerability. Um, wow. Thanks be to God for your story. Like just 
it's incredible. So thank you. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thanks, everyone. Um, yeah. One of the questions that did come in while you were sharing your story, um, mm -hmm. we'll dive into the story, the, sorry, the question time now. Just want to find it here. Yeah. It was from John. He said, can father explain that more love equals time plus attention? Would you be able to just kind yeah. of explain that a little bit more? Yeah, it's a quote from a, I think a Catholic philosopher. I, I'm not exactly who said that, but, um, but yeah, just like, you know, sometimes we think of, you know, you hear about how love's not a feeling and this sort of thing, right? But then like, yeah, what does that actually look like, right? And so that quote makes it concrete, you know? So the thing that I love is the thing to which I give my time and attention. Um, yeah, mm. so that's basically the idea. That's, you know? yeah, it's, it's good. All right, what is the most sanctifying part of being a priest? Gotta go with the Eucharist, for sure, you know? Yeah. Um, but 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 both both things like like um, mass, but also um, adoration, you know. Yeah. And so one of the things I, I I rag on my current parish shop continuously is like, even though there's that saying the world is God's cathedral, like honestly, like like the Eucharist, right? Yeah. Um. And so so even with this whole thing about like, um, online mass or whatever, and certainly there's there's a reason why. People might not go to, to mass because of vulnerable part of the population, pre-existing condition, all legitimate fear, all those things. And leg, they're legit, right? Yeah. But then to, to kind of like, you know, to have the simple, clear answer as to like, what's the difference between online mass and regular mass? Like, you can't get the Eucharist on your iPad. <laughs> right. I like, that's it. And, and then that should be like, just like that, right? Yeah. Um, and then also like, okay, where do I find the Lord? Oh, gosh. Like, well, like, like the Lord in the Blessed Sacrament, right? Mm -hmm. You know? Like, yeah. um, and so something that's really kind of neat right now, like we just opened up this uh, perpetual adoration chapel at our parish. And it's like 24 seven. And like, especially now with like the lockdown and stuff, like it's so great to see people come in there at all hours of the day. Yeah, you know? I was gonna bring that up and actually, so, perpetual adoration chapel, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we did the fundraising and did the renovations like before COVID and Thanks before even like Lent, you know? So it totally worked out. Yeah. You know? Um, but you just get a sense that people are like, okay, like we realize now, if we didn't before, that the Eucharist is a privilege. And so uh, people are there at like one in the morning or like five mm -hmm. in the morning or you know, throughout the day, obviously. So it's been really great. That's amazing. And yeah, we used to have a perpetual adoration chapel just down the street, but because of COVID, unfortunately, they, they shut it down. Oh. Same kind of thing. There was a passcode where if I wanted to go pray yeah. at two o'clock in the morning, you could just key in that password and go in. So definitely miss it i mean i by by no means am i a padre pio but i i'm telling you sometimes when i'm praying i'm like lord jesus just like teleport me to the church right now i just want <laughs> dude, right. i want, I want you, to be man. present yeah. to jesus in the eucharist it's it's not easy not being able to go to mass right now i'm telling you yeah yeah um how do you stay steadfast in dark times um i think what's important like the example the, the quote that comes to mind my uh, my current spiritual director uh, he said, you'd be amazed how little thinking has to do with the spiritual life, you know? And so, mm. to, to, you know, it's, it's a variation of what Ignatius talks about, where he's like, don't dialogue with spiritual desolation, you know? And so a lot of times what happens is like, we, we just, our minds just start going, you know? And you want to rein that in, you know? Yeah. Um, so along the same lines, um, my spiritual director right now, he said, you know, if I were to guess, I would say 90% of thoughts enter your mind or like total garbage. Mm. And, and, and so you should actively, not just in a, in a Lucy kind of like, Lucy Goose here story, I, I weakly push the thing away. It's like, no, like that is not from the Lord. And I push it away in favor of the 10% that I actively choose because is the Lord calling me to, to dwell on these thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. So I think to be really firm about that, like it's a variation of, again, situating everything in God's call. That That's really huge. The other thing I, I would say too is to realize that everything's accounted for, you know? Like, I, I remember seeing this uh, show on Shalom Media with this Harvard professor, I guess. Mm -hmm. And he was like, he was thinking like, oh man, like, you know, like where's their meaning in life and where's their love? And then he had this encounter with the living Christ and he just kind of realized in an instant that like every moment is pregnant with meaning. And mm -hmm. every moment, like he's carried, with, he's carried by a love which completely defies imagination. And so like, okay, like, what if I believe both those things moment to moment, right? Mm -hmm. And you realize that as a consequence, there's, there's a lot of things that you're worried about, whatever that like you should not worry about. Yeah. Um, you know, so like, yeah. so, but, but the thing is to realize that 
part of the deal is not that you understand why this thing is being permitted. That's never part of the deal, right? But just to trust that, okay, like everything is within God's providence. So maybe I'm going through this thing and it's confusing and it's painful and this sort of thing. Yeah. But um, I trust that even that God is using this for his self ethic purposes. Yeah. In a way which I might never understand, but you know what? That's okay. Cause I don't need to understand. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's so interesting what you said about the, the thoughts and, and how you only need to pay attention to 10% of them. Cause I, I, I met with a student who shared with me that, you know, it's like, sir, I just feel sad all the time. I just get negative thoughts. Yeah. I said, you know, uh, the Bible talks about the renewing of the mind where you take captive those mm-hmm. thoughts. You use the power of the name of Jesus and, uh, yeah. and tell it where to go. Right. Met yeah. with him maybe yeah. two weeks later. And he's like, sir, I'm in such a different place. And I said, why? And he said, when those thoughts come to me, I just don't allow it to, to, I don't entertain them anymore because I can decide, you know, and he said, that's completely changed my mindset. So thanks be to God for that. Yeah. One of the questions that did come in, uh, what is the number one threat facing young men in the church and how can young men overcome this threat? Any thoughts on that? It's a big question. (laughs) Um, yeah. Yeah. Can you say it again? Sorry. Sorry. Um, what is the number one threat facing young men in the church and how can young men overcome this threat? Um, yeah, I, I think to young, young men have to believe that they're called to greatness and they can be great. Hmm. And, and, and not in the sense of like doing a lot of flashy things, but like, like being great. What do I offer the Lord? A well-ordered soul, I think, you know? So it's so an example that comes to mind. Um, again, movie example. Um, <laughs> Love it. Le, you know, Les Mis, right? Yeah. The whole beginning with the priest and stuff like that, right? Where like Sean Valjean, he's like in prison, like all those years. And like, okay, did he steal the piece of bread? Yeah, he totally did, right? But then that guy and, and like the, the Russell Crowe character, it's just like, look, like you did this thing. And so therefore you're this number and you got this piece of paper and that's you forever, right? Mm-hmm. And like he, at first he's resisting, but because he's been beaten down so much, he, he kind of gives into it. And then he goes back into the world and people are rejecting him, treating him cruelly. So even when the bishop comes and initially he's, he's nice to him, he, he responds with viciousness because it's just like, no, no, like, like I, I dare I trust the, the truth that mm-hmm. I have dignity he's a child of God, right? And so what happens is the bishop, like he sings that song or whatever, right? But, but basically what he's saying to this guy is like, no, like, like I believe in you and you're, you're called to greatness, right? Yeah. And like, insofar as you believe in that, like that's going to change not just your life, but like everyone's else, everyone else's life. Like mm-hmm. it's going to proliferate, you know? Absolutely. So I think with a lot of young guys, with a lot of young guys, they, they fall into the sense of, um, um, heathenism is a loaded word, you know, but, but in the sense of like, okay, like what do I, what can I do over the course of this day and this week? I, oh man, like life is so stressful. I, I could just, you know, find like these little pleasures here and there. And like, that's it. That's my life. Right. And it's like, no, 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 you can, you can do better. You can do better. And, and like with God's grace, anything's possible. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. Yeah. 100%. You made me think of uh, when I came home to the church, I was 21 years old and I actually said to God, I said, God, if you want me to be this man of God, I think you want me to be, you have to send me a buddy that's going to lift me up and encourage me when I fall, you know? And I met a really good friend, Preston, who just constantly would look me right in the eyes and would say, David, you're good. And what's crazy yeah. is that like in that moment, I just, my first thought was you're a liar because if you right. really knew how, how messed up, you know, how, how wrong, um, I've, I've acted and, uh, he just kept speaking that into me and I, I can't yeah. begin to explain how much that just catapulted me on my journey of faith, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks to God for absolutely. that. All right. Moving on. Actually, sorry, on, on that, sorry, on, on that note, one thing I wanted to mention, I, I forgot to mention this with regards to Monsignor Sheehy. Uh, okay. So during an internship, like um, something he taught me, and I, I'm just like mindful of your audience here, right? Like, like he said, you know, if you in the privacy of your room, for example, like go to your room and say like, oh man, like I'm sad or I feel like I don't like myself for this reason. Okay, whatever, right? But he, he said like, you know, love in the Christian in, in, in the Christian mindset is, is incarnational, right? So if, if you, if you place yourself in the presence of, of like you're saying, like, like Preston, right. Uh, of someone in whose love you have confidence in, 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 in whose love that you trust and you take a chance and you don't just like, like say, Oh, I'm feeling sad. I'm feeling blah. Like, like you, you actually have the thing play out in that person's presence. And you kind of like take yourself to the, almost to the breaking point and beyond and you realize that person still loves you in spite of the thing that's playing out right in real time, like that's healing. Yeah. And, and the thing is like, 
part of part of the journey of becoming the person that God wants you to be is that you got to go through that over and over again. We got to do that for each other. Yeah. You know, as a, as a church, we need to, we really need to, to dive deeper in that, you know, that yeah. to actually suffer with um, mm-hmm. those who are really just suffering right now. 100%. Moving on to the next question. Uh, number three, what advice would you give to those who have lost their zeal for mass since COVID? Yeah, right. Um, well, I think, yeah, you gotta, you gotta wonder about the zeal for mass before COVID actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. Cause, cause kind of like what comes to mind, um, we were hearing a story about, uh, the philosopher Voltaire, you know, where he was like talking about, um, he had his disciples and he was trying to convince them to like, you know, leave the church and whatnot. And this one, one guy came up to him, this young man. And he was like, you know, um, I want to be an atheist. I want to like disbelieve in everything the church represents, but I just can't shake the, the notion that Christ is really present in the Eucharist. So like, what do I do about that? And Voltaire was like, Oh, that's really easy. Like, um, basically live a life of contradiction, you know? So like keep on receiving the Eucharist, um, every day, multiple times per day if you can, mm-hmm. but like tell the Lord, I don't believe in you. I hate you. And, and in, in terms of your actions, your sins, whatever, like, just like, actively live the sinful life moral sin for moral sin and whatever like that um and then i remember because it was like it wasn't even a round number it was like within like five months or something that kid was like an atheist and that's the end of the story yeah. <laughs> there's no there's no happy ending to that right yeah um yeah and so like the one of the, the challenges that are being put before us with covid is like um it's almost a variation of the lord saying like who do you say that i am right mm. And, and, and therefore, what do, what do you do, you know? Um, and so, okay, like now's the time for for the church and its members to um, really live lives of integrity, to revisit like you know like the core things, like what do we actually believe, and do I live in accordance with the truth which is proposed by the church? Um, and, and 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 to realize that it's a binary option, right? So either I I, I live have this sense of like I give my all to the reality of Christ and everything that implies or I don't in which case I don't know Voltaire right <laughs> it's kind of, it's kind of like the the scripture or sort of the same quote that you gave even for for this week of um where Jesus says to Peter are you going to leave too you know where the disciples right. just walked with with um you know it's my my true flesh my true blood right yeah. And, then, and then where Peter says, Lord, where are we going to go? You have the words of eternal life. Right. right. Absolutely. Very yeah. much so. Yeah. Amen. Where do you think the church? Well, sorry. Well, I was going to say the, the whole thing with that too. I mean, just again, yeah. to read between the lines. Here's Peter. And it's just like, you know, dude, I'm, I'm just a fisherman, right? Like yeah. kind of substantiation, real presence. Are you kidding me? <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but that's just it. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's why even with mass, right? Like, I mean, certainly one of the challenges is to really develop a, um, um, a complete catechesis with regards to the mass, which is, which is a tall order. Like math is not one of those things you can just walk into a Sunday mass and like know it intuitively. Like it's, it's mm-hmm. not like that. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But at the same time, even if all you know is that like, it's like the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, like that is the Lord. Right. Yeah. Like it's, it's independent of like the homily, which could be boring, <laughs> you know, like, like, like at the end of the day, it's like, it's still the Eucharist. Right. Um, anyways, that's a whole tangent, but... yeah, that's, <laughs> that's, a, that's a whole other conversation. Um, wh- where do you, where do you think the church needs to focus in today's culture? Um, I think, well, two things. I, I think, um, clarity in terms mm-hmm. of like, this is what the church actually teaches with regards to this issue, that issue, but also complexity, you know? So it, it's both, right? So I'm mindful of the quote by uh, G.K. Chesterton where he's like, talks about life. And he's like, life is like a complex lock. So you need an equally complex t- key to unlock that lock, you know? Mm. Um, and so, yeah, so it's one of these things where like people can go through grade two, for example, catechesis. And it's like, well, yeah, don't lie, don't cheat, be nice to animals and whatever, right? Yeah. And then like, okay, they land the grade seven and it's just like, don't lie, don't cheat. <laughs> sort of like, right? But then like, but then if their faith isn't growing in correspondence with their actual age, then all of a sudden, like they reach like the adult world and, you know, oh, the heck, my faith is immature, right? And my faith is, can't handle the complexities of the world. But actually, it totally can. 
yeah. but you just didn't grow with, with, with your own faith, you know? Mm -hmm. You didn't allow the faith to grow with you, I should say. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so, so I, think, I think what happens is as a church, we, we kind of, um, we give up too quickly, I think, sometimes, you know, where, where I always think about my meeting with my first church director was just like, you know, telling me, it's just like, you don't know your faith was luck. And just being brutally honest about that. And okay, I'm mad, right? But he's right. You know? Yeah. And like, you know, whatever. I wasn't like I was already working as a lawyer, right? So whatever. How old was that? 20, 22, 23? I don't know. Whatever. Okay. Yeah. Um, so like, yeah, it's like there's you, you got time, right? And it, it was, you know, I had I had catch up time, you know, but whatever, you know. So Yeah. Yeah. No, it's good. All right. What advice would you give to those who who are in ministry? Yeah, I think with um people in ministry to realize that uh, the stakes are pretty high, you know? And so um, a couple of things that could flow from that. First yeah. of all, to, um, to be really honest about what's working and what's not, you know? So th there can be, the, I think there can be this complacency like, hey, like we're doing all these things. And it's like, right, <laughs> but, <laughs> but are they working, <laughs> right? Mm. Um, and to be just honest about that and be, to be open to, to change, you know? Um, and to also realize there's, there's a complexity within like, um, the, the population of society, you know? So I, I always joke about this internally with our staff here at the parish, but just like, um, you know, we have like youth groups, right? right. But like, what would be funny is if, if we told people like, hey, look, this is the, the adults group, you know? People are like, what? But like, adult, that can mean a whole bunch of different things. It's like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know, like, absolutely, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, you know, so, so even little things like, okay, like um, if you think about this type of kid versus that type of kid, right? Like um like what things would they would they would appeal to them and what things would not right and what would work what what doesn't but because they're so quick quick to think okay well it's the fault of the people of god that this thing isn't working and it's like well is it though <laughs> is it though mm. um and so one of the great things about COVID now is that you see people are like really pushing the envelope um so as as a yeah as a concrete example i think about guys i went to school with in seminary and like, man, now some of them are doing like live streaming and whatever, right? And like, it, it, like God bless them, right? Yeah. Like, just like, because circumstances demand that we, we do this. And, and that's a recurring pattern throughout the, throughout the history of the church. Like whenever we see an ecumenical council, it always arises in, in, in response to a, a conflict or a crisis, which is, which yeah, is kind of developed true. unexpectedly, right? And so to kind of like recognize what's before us and like to bring like the, the, the energy and the passion and creativity to, that kind of meets the demand that's being put before us. Yeah. Like that's, that's the church, right? Yeah. 100%. Yeah. No, for sure. 100%. That's, that's some great advice, Father. Thank you so much. Uh, who's your favorite saint and why? Uh, St. Peter, because uh, he's a screw up. And, uh, <laughs> but also because, well, two things, like, because he's a screw up and you see that documented in the gospels, which is probably pretty funny. But but also because um, like Christ sees his heart, you know, so it gives you hope, right? Yeah. So like you know like because of all the guys, like why did you pick like this guy to be pope, right? And uh, again, right between the lines, but I just think like here's this guy, like he just he puts himself out there because he's, he's trying his best to love the Lord, and and it results in him, you know, sinking and denying the Lord three times and like all these yeah. different things, right? Yeah. But like, as opposed to those other guys who kind of stay in the background, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's 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 kind of both, right? Yeah. Um, which is a really, yeah, it's really inspiring and helpful for us as you're kind of struggling through the journey. Yeah, he's just such a great image of hope for all of us. <laughs> if you think about oh it. my gosh, yeah. But yeah, mm -hmm. like, okay, there's hope for me. Jesus Jesus um, still loves me in the midst of my mess, right? Yeah. And it's not even like, okay, like I, I tolerate you because like whatever, right? It's like, no, yeah. like, you're Pope. No, I was like, whoa, what? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the church kind of has to be built on mercy and forgiveness, if you, if you think about it, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, what would you want to be the patron saint of? It's an interesting question that came in. Uh, patron saint. Um, pat well, I mean, I don't know. Patron saint of, like, trusting in the Lord, trusting in his mercy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, last question that did come in was, uh, Father Eric, how can our listeners find and connect with you in Catholic Latte? Oh. Do you want to speak, you. A little, um, speak a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah. So Catholic Latte, um, it's this podcast. Um, uh, I have a vi video version and an audio version. So if you want to listen to it, um, Spotify. Um, yeah, Spotify is probably the best way to go about it. Uh, Stitcher is also on Stitcher. 
but uh, you can also watch it on YouTube and Facebook. And uh, if you go to Catholic Latte on Instagram, um, just click click on the link in the bio and it takes you to the YouTube page. Um, mm-hmm. But the best way to watch it is yeah, the best way to watch it is YouTube, um, just because it's um, yeah, it's better quality, I think. Um, also, it's kind of interesting. I, I recently um, got picked up by um, Shalom World, actually. Nice. So they're, they're start, they're, yeah, they're starting to show Catholic Latte episodes on Mondays, um, uh, six thirty Eastern time. Wow, so they show that's the first exciting. Thing. Yeah, last week, so kind of nice. That's that's awesome. Yeah. Congratulations, Father. Oh, thanks. Buddy. And how did how did uh, Catholic Latte come to be? Was it? Yeah, yeah. Curious. I've always wanted to do. Yeah, I've always wanted to do something like that. So um, I've been planning it even before COVID, actually. So just when COVID happened, it was just like, oh, this is convenient. You know, we got yeah. all this stuff here. You know, right. so I remember getting one of the students in. And it's just like, look, look, you got to teach me how to use this stuff because if I don't start the podcast during COVID, like, <laughs> not until until the useless thing. <laughs> so, um, but I think the whole idea was just just to get the message out to to a wider audience. You know, mm-hmm. so like for example, like you know, you saw I did a thing on Wonder Woman, and yeah. like, um, yeah, like like uh, on Facebook, like ten thousand hits. You know, Incredible. right? And like and yeah, and like uh, like a lot of things with social media, like you um you get a certain demographic that you wouldn't normally get mm-hmm. at, at churches and stuff. Right. Yeah. And also you can develop themes a little bit longer and stuff too. Yeah. Um, and with COVID, like, um, I don't know, like we're just taking a different approach because I, I, I can feel there's a lot of um, uh, live stream masses out there. So I wanted to have sort of a complimentary approach as opposed to a duplicative one, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. Well, on that note, father, I just want to thank you so much, you know, for your yes to Jesus and his church. When I saw you uh, give your homily at uh, lift Jesus higher, I was just, you know, so thankful for your priesthood and just the way that you spoke to the young people was just with such faith and conviction. And, um, yeah, just so thankful for, for your life and your story. It's just, it's got God all over it, you know, thanks be to God. Um, well, thanks David, for the opportunity and, and just, and God bless you for, for your ministry too. Like really just, uh, to see all the things you're posting through the Catholic and the people you're connecting with, it's really tremendous. So First I'm really time. glad we're able to do this. Yeah, it's, yeah. Been, it's been a lot of fun tonight. Uh, would you be able to close us in prayer? Yeah, sure. I'm going to give a little simple prayer. Absolutely. <laughs> so Son, Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, as now, and ever shall be, world of end. Amen. Uh, St. Joseph, pray for us. Holy Mary, our hope seat of wisdom, pray for us. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Right. Amen. 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 Thank you, Father, so much. Uh, thank you to everyone oh, for tuning in tonight. Or sorry, not tonight. Tomorrow, we've got Rachel Wong. She's going to be sharing her story. So they, it, it just continues. A yes, Catholic. We're we're going every week. It's it's awesome. So thank you again. Be sure to follow Catholic Latte, Father Eric. Check out his podcast. He's got amazing stuff uh, coming on a regular basis. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Hope you have a great evening.